defective matrices. That is matrices that have eigenvalues whose algebraic multiplicity exceeds their geometric multiplicity are an interesting breed. They're also called non-diagonalizable, which is a term that will make total sense to you when we study diagonalization and the eigenvalue decomposition. Now, defective matrices arise relatively infrequently in applications. You will see them when you study linear ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients, but not much beyond that. Nevertheless, defective matrices are very important to understand because without them, the eigenvalue picture would be incomplete. So let's get right to it. Here is what quintessential defective matrices look like. They're upper or lower triangular matrices with two or more of the same value on the diagonal, in this case three, and non-zero values on the sub-diagonal. So let's go ahead and figure out the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix and see what we get, and specifically what this pattern leads to. And it will be easy to see that three is a double eigenvalue of this matrix, simply because the characteristic polynomial of this matrix has three minus lambda squared and no other terms. You always get a characteristic polynomial with just a single term when you're working with a triangular matrix. In this case, the characteristic polynomial will be three minus lambda cubed, and therefore three will be a triple eigenvalue of this matrix. So, back to this matrix, the algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalue three is two. So we count three twice. Now, what's the corresponding eigenvector? More interestingly, what's the dimension of the corresponding eigenspace? Well, let's do what we're supposed to do. Subtract three from the diagonal and see what we get. And here is what we get. We get a matrix whose null space is one dimensional. Unlike what we saw before in an earlier video when we were discussing a matrix with an eigenvalue of high algebraic multiplicity. Back then, we got a matrix whose null space was two dimensional. In this case, we get a matrix whose null space is one dimensional. And you can see that this two is the culprit. And so the null space of this matrix is one dimensional. More precisely, it is represented by the vector one zero. Thus, the algebraic multiplicity of this eigenvalue is 2. And the geometric multiplicity of this eigenvalue, which is the dimension of the corresponding eigenspace, is 1. And that's what defective matrices give us. And so the answer to the question that was asked in earlier videos, is it possible for the algebraic multiplicity to exceed the geometric multiplicity, is yes, and defective matrices prove it. Now the question to the opposite question, can geometric multiplicity exceed the algebraic multiplicity, is no. But we'll save that for another video. In this video, I'd like to mention several more facts regarding defective matrices. Number one, do defective matrices always look like this? Are they always upper or lower triangular matrices with two or more of the same value on the diagonal and non-zero values on the off diagonal? And the answer is, on the surface, yes, but deep down, no. On the surface, this matrix is also defective. What are its eigenvalues? Well, its trace is six and its determinant is nine. So we're looking for two numbers that add up to six and multiply to nine. And of course, it's once again, three and three. So three will once again be an eigenvalue of algebraic multiplicity two. What's the geometric multiplicity of this eigenvalue? In other words, what's the dimension of the corresponding eigenspace? Well, we can easily visualize what happens when we subtract one, excuse me, three from the diagonal. We get a matrix whose null space is one dimensional. More precisely, its null space is represented by the vector one, one. But the specific vector is not important. 
What's important is that the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue 3 is one-dimensional, and therefore this matrix is also defective. So no, a defective matrix does not have to look like this. In fact, a random defective matrix, whatever that means, looks more like a normal matrix. However, when we study diagonalization and the eigenvalue decomposition, we will learn that deep down, in a very certain sense that we'll discuss later, all defective matrices have this kind of structure. So that's something to look forward to in the future. Now, back to defective matrices in the now. Number two, uh, let's talk about the defect. The defect is the quantity by which the algebraic multiplicity, in this case two, exceeds the geometric multiplicity. In this case it's one, and so the defect is two minus one. It's the amount by which the algebraic multiplicity exceeds the geometric multiplicity. Can the defect be greater than one? And the answer is, of course it can. And this matrix demonstrates it. The defect can be as large as you want. In the case of this matrix, as we already mentioned, three is a triple eigenvalue. Yet, if we visualize subtracting three from the diagonal, we'll be left with a matrix whose null space is still one dimensional, represented by the vector one, zero, zero. And once again, what vector it's represented by is not important. What's important is that the dimension of this eigenspace is 1. And so the defect in this case is 2, 3 minus 1. And so it's easy to see that you could come up with a matrix with any defect you want. And finally, I would like to make this note. The property of being defective is very fragile. Here's what I mean by that. If we were to change just about any entry in this matrix by just a little bit, the resulting matrix will no longer be defective. It's easy to see if you were to change one of these threes by a little bit. Three will no longer be a double eigenvalue. We will have two different eigenvalues, even if it's by a little bit, and two linearly independent eigenvectors. More interestingly, if we were to change this entry by just a little bit, let's change it by one part in a trillion. Let's change it by one trillionth. The resulting matrix is once again no longer defective. It has two distinct eigenvalues and two linearly independent eigenvectors. In fact, the eigenvalues change by one part in a million. If you do the calculation, you'll see that. You may say that's still a small change, but it's a million times greater than the perturbation. And so the change in the eigenvalues is not even proportional to the perturbation. It is much greater. You might say, well, you could accuse any exact characteristic of being fragile. For example, being symmetric is fragile because if you change one of the off-diagonal entries in a symmetric matrix M, it will no longer be symmetric, so, so there. Well, there are two major differences between this situation and this situation. First of all, symmetric matrices usually arise in applications as product A transpose A. And it would be the matrix A that might change by a little bit because it came from experimental data or some other physical application. So A will change a little bit, and so A transpose A will change by a little bit, but the product A transpose A, although different from before, would still be symmetric. So in this sense, being symmetric is much more stable, much more stable than being defective. You can't even compare them. Furthermore, if we forget for a moment where the matrix M may have come from, and just consider a symmetric matrix M and talk about changing one of its entries a little bit. What would be the corresponding change in the eigenvalues? And if we performed analysis, we would discover that the change in the eigenvalues would be proportional to the perturbation of the matrix, even if you perturb off-diagonal entries like we did here. So if we change an off-diagonal entry by one part in a billionth, 
the change in the eigenvalues would be approximately that large, which is very different from this case, where the resulting perturbation in the eigenvalue was a million times larger. Yes, it was still small, but it was a million times larger than the perturbation. And so perhaps it's partly for this reason that defective matrices don't arise frequently in applications. Because if they were to arise, they would arise directly. And the probability that a random matrix, and all matrices in applications and the physical world have a little bit of a random component to them. So the probability that a random matrix in that sense is defective is zero. A random matrix is never defective. It is a very particular fragile property. And that, in my mind, is what makes defective matrices quite interesting. And that is why we should talk about them a little bit more.